Editing long podcasts like this or webinars for social is time consuming. Simplified AI Clips uses AI to turn your lengthy videos into short, viral clips. Create shareable content from your recordings in a few minutes. Built for small businesses and marketers looking to save time and boost engagement, visit simplified.com and use Annika30 to save 30% today. Welcome to Your Brand Amplified, the podcast where we interview marketers, publicists, and brands to learn their stories, what makes them tick, and tips and tricks that make a difference. I am so thrilled on this episode of Your Brand Amplified to welcome Dr. Danielle Beal. Danielle, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me. I um, enjoy talking about all the things we're going to talk about, and I hope that I can be a beacon of hope to someone out here listening. Absolutely. Now, you are one of our phenomenal women, and I am so thrilled to have you on. I think all the stories have been so uplifting and encouraging. So before I get into any other questions, I want you to share your story and your journey with us. Okay. So um, in the book, I started out by telling my story at the beginning of my understanding of it. And that is that I was born in jail to um, my mom, who was 19 years old, who was um, convicted of murdering my father. Um, And um, that's where my story kind of started. Ultimately, she was... um, um, I don't know how to say, like, she was not convicted of murdering him, but that it was in self-defense. Mm. Um, but that kind of was the foundation of where my life um, kind of started going. Um, we were in and out of foster homes growing up and ultimately were endured a lot of childhood trauma, me and my siblings. Um, I grew up and accidentally uh, found myself in college through one of the other phenomenal woman authors who kind of took me under her wing Mm. and said, uh, she's a black woman and said, as long as I know and love you, you are going to do something great with your life and kind of drop me off at college. (laughs) Um, I found myself pregnant my first semester in undergrad. My second semester, my mom died of complications from her years of drug and alcohol abuse. And I found myself adopting my then 11 year old brother. So at 19, I had two children. My My first year in college, um, I found myself homeless because I was leaving a horrific relationship with my daughter's father, trying to learn how to get out of it. And, um, survived all of that, ended up finding a really amazing job in the field of behavior analysis where I was starting to work with children. And this felt safe and it felt good. I knew that I wanted to protect and be a conduit of good for little black and brown children that I was serving. And that just kind of shaped my career. Um, I loved the work that I was doing so much for the first time in my life. I had found some stability. I was finding um, that I was filled with hope, that I was actually really good at what I was doing. I'd never known that in my life before. And so that just kind of, you know, exponentially led me to the path of being able to continue that. Um, I accidentally found myself in a master's program because I needed to (laughs) keep my job. Um, I found uh, that I was really good at sign language. And so I became an interpreter simultaneously as another (laughs) one of my hustles. Um, And then, you know, fast forward a few years, I was a single mom, really struggled with all of the effects the childhood trauma had had on my life was kind of on my healing journey throughout this process. And then more recently decided to go back to school. I opened up my own agency um, because I really wanted to provide services to black and brown communities differently than the way that I was offering them to the people I was working for. There was a big kind of shift in the values that I was providing and the values of the people I was working for. So I opened up my own agency 
And in that, realized that I wanted to help diagnose some of the, the, the children that I was serving. So there's a big kind of barrier between um, black and brown children getting a diagnosis and then them receiving service services. So I wanted to bridge that barrier. Mm -hmm. So I decided to go back to school for my CITES so that I could diagnose. And that opened up the door to my contribution in phenomenal Woman specifically. And it helped me to reexamine my own trauma, where then I was really understanding the impact that my journey and my life had had in my resilience and the way that I was showing up for my community. And it kind of spearheaded into this now like other big phenomena of me really wanting to support black and brown, I think, women deal with their unresolved trauma so that they can move into a life of intentional kind of living and being fully present with themselves and their healing journey so that they can live a life full of joy. Mm. And so now I do all the things and I'm really just wanting to be a beacon of support and hope for anyone who um, has had to have some really difficult kind of um, mountains that have been put in their journey. So that's kind of my story and, and what I'm doing now. Wow. Well, and kudos to you because it would have been very easy for you to follow in the footsteps of continuing the path. I mean, you did get pregnant when you were young. You had to adopt your brother. You were homeless, but you still persevered. You stayed in school. You figured out what your strong points were, and then you were able to help start breaking that cycle and create a better life for yourself and then examine what you wanted to do and realize, oh, I can help diagnose and provide services for others to help them break a cycle of trauma and gener all this generational stuff that we we hold into our cells. Yeah. And you know, the thing that is really interesting when I reflect back is I didn't know that I was doing that. I did have a moment of like realization when I found out I was pregnant and I told my mom and she said to me, you're going to end up exactly like me. And so my whole life, I always had a mindset that I had to do everything different than, than my mom. Um, and so it was in that moment that it was solidified that if I don't become intentional about what I'm doing and how I'm doing it, I'm going to end up, I was in a relationship that was abusive. That was on the verge of becoming much more abusive than it, than it had been. Um, I was 19, you know, with, you know, pregnant, same as her, um, and that's when it dawned me when she made that comment to me that I was stuck in a cycle. I couldn't name all the parts. I couldn't name it as generational trauma or generational mm -hmm. curses. So me staying in school was the only thing that I had that I, to do something different than my mom had. And so that mm -hmm. was really a saving grace for me. Absolutely. And you've mentioned three things that a lot of entrepreneurs bring up on the podcast. Um, and that I am a firm believer in one is authenticity. Mm -hmm. So you realize that your values didn't match the values of the company that you're yes. working for. And so you said, I can't do this. I have to change because you needed to be authentic and true to who yes. you were and your beliefs. You mentioned passion. You realized that this is something you're really passionate about. And then you also um, mentioned being intentional mm -hmm. about your path and your journey. And um, some things just presented themselves to you as opportunities, but you took advantage of them all along the way. And those are three things that any entrepreneur, whether you are in, you know, a service or goods, or you are therapy, <laughs> you're helping heal people, you have a nonprofit, and all of those have that same, those same yeah. core tenants that you need to have. Yeah, I didn't, again, this was something else I didn't realize. And now, um, cause I've always operated different than I think. Mm -hmm. I always say that people make lines with thick black sharpies right and and they're rigid and you know they they create these boxes that we're supposed to fit into and that they have this expectation that people are supposed to conform to but i've always operated with a gray washable crayola mm. right and so i've always had this kind of uh, fluidity about me, um, I think as a result of my trauma, and now I, I recognize it as learned resilience, which is unfortunate, mm -hmm. but it is a matter of how I was able to overcome. So I've always operated outside of those thick, rigid lines, and I didn't have 
a name for some of the things that I'm experiencing now, although I've always been punished for those things, right? Like for being different and for having the passion that, that I had. And even, you know, at 19, when I first walked into like the field of behavior analysis, not knowing that what I was doing was providing equitable services for, you know, the communities that I was serving. And now there are these big buzzwords and people are like <laughs> talking about intentionality and right. passion. But for 24 years of my life, it's been, they've been punishers for me. And so a part of my message now is giving, I think, specifically young people, young women of color permission to use whatever they want to use to make the boxes that they fit in and to stop trying to conform into, you know, those thick, rigid, sharpie boxes that people make for them because it's harmful. And that contributes, I think, to some of the harm that people have to endure unnecessarily. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think this also goes to show you don't know someone's story until you get to speak to them about it. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm teaching graduate students now, and I'm finding a big part of my role is really I need to be there to support them in their journeys. Yes. My whole class is all people of color. They all have their own stories. Some are you know, having great experiences at work. Some are feeling otherized and tokenized at work. Yes. And they're telling me about this. Um, when I'm meeting with them one-on-one -on -one and I'm like, oh, that was my aha moment where I'm like, I'm not just here to teach them about branding or PR. I'm also here to help guide them and make sure that they know whatever path they choose is okay. Yeah. They don't have to go work for an agency if they don't want to. They can go out on their own. They can freelance. They can work virtually. They can find some, you know, they can find a nonprofit. They can find something that really fits with who they are yeah. and can help them. I think that that's brilliant because I've been a part of, so to back up a little bit um, and to bring some context to what you're just saying, it resonated with me so deeply because I've been a part of the educational system for 24 years. I spent 24 years of my education and that was all by accident. My <laughs> mom was, uh, she dropped out of high school. My dad dropped out of high school. Oh. They have very, I'm the first generation, everything, first generation, high school graduate, like business owner, do, you know, doctor in the family. Um, and I'm just now walking into the gravity of, of this. Um, but I've been harmed by a system. And so during the time that I was in my grad school program, um, I'm a business owner. I have a grown, you know, adult child. I have a young child. I've raised babies my entire life. And I come into the system thinking that I'm coming to contribute to this educational kind of system. Mm -hmm. And I was severely traumatized in my experience as a doc, as a doctorate student, doctoral student. I also teach a master's and, um, you know, PhD, PsyD level students. And one of the things that I found is that it's not my job to necessarily teach. Like I can teach from my experiences. I can teach from a set of um, knowledge that I've learned over the years, but I can't teach another person how to be. Mm. And any interference of that can cause potential harm. So during my process, when I'm, you know, got introduced to the phenomenal, you know, woman movement, um, I was the last author to be considered. It was completely by accident. I say it was all God. Uh, <laughs> But as I was telling my story and I was enduring some of the trauma that I experienced as a student who, mm. you know, was older, there was ageism, there was discrimination, there was racism, there was a bunch of stuff that I was fighting against. I realized that educators do not have, I think, all the tools to be trauma assumed and mm. trauma informed. And with that lack of knowledge, they can cause unintentional harm. I was literally in the process of writing my dissertation, which is defining risk and resiliency factors for Black American women wow. um, in American society, experiencing some of these traumatic events and then realizing that the people who were supposed to care for me, like my professors, completely further caused harm that to this day I'm still working through. So I love to hear you talking about your approach to support and that it just doesn't look like this top-down approach, but it's really, I always say this bi-directional kind of mm. way of engaging with any person sitting across from you, taking out some of those um, 
I don't know how to describe that. Um, you know, some of those barriers that that feel like it's top down, because I think that those, again, can be harmful. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So let's talk about your businesses. You have a nonprofit and you have a business, correct? Yes, I don't have a nonprofit. It is actually a for-profit, but okay. it's called a non-public agency. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and so basically it can be confusing. Um, so basically what we do, it's called Loving Hands Family Support Services. And we provide um, ABA services right now to black and brown communities across Southern California. Mm. So what this means is we are in school districts primarily supporting educators, um, special ed departments, mm -hmm. administrators, and making sure that we are providing equitable access to meaningful resources. And so that means that we go into every situation, not just identifying a student, a black or brown student who has behaviors, but that we're looking at the entire environment and we're saying what's contributing to this child engaging in these behaviors. And we're addressing those issues, not just the child. Um, a part of our com community has spent many, many, many years and generations um, trying to demystify and destigmatize this idea that, that this community engages in these behaviors and they're harmful to society. And mm -hmm. so part of our mission is to eradic eradicate some of that and provide meaningful resources. So we're providing education. We are going in, like I said previously, trauma-informed and trauma-assumed. Mm -hmm. I don't need for you to disclose that you've been traumatized for me to treat you like a human being. Wow. Right. We're just walking into the situation and I'm looking at variables. And when we see a kiddo who's shut down or a kiddo who's in, you know, enraged and explosive, what are we doing to make that person feel safe? Yeah. We also provide safe employment for black and brown clinicians based on my own traumatic employment um, history. I thought it was really important to allow another person to come in who's been traumatized and work through some of the barriers that come up for those traumatized people so that they're not continually being re-traumatized. So that's one of the things that Loving Hands does. As soon as I pass my licensure, we will have a mental health department where we are working to support newly diagnosed parents and treating victims and survivors of trauma in any capacity. Um, and so that's a little bit about what Loving Hands does. So have you seen a difference in the last couple of years? Because I feel like I've seen in my daughter's school district and even for USC in our faculty meetings, there's a lot more discussion around mental health and identifying factors and how you help students. If you yes. see somebody who's going through something. And I feel like before, to your point, it was more of like, oh, this is a behavior issue. Get the student out of my class. I don't want to deal with them. I have to deal with all these other students. I'm a harried teacher. Mm -hmm. but, but really, if you're not dealing with the underlying issues, that child is not getting help. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So I'm definitely seeing a difference. And it's actually maddening to me. Like I'm, I'm on my soapbox every day. Because <laughs> I've been screaming this for 24 years, even before, like I said, I had the technical language, yeah. I, I knew like I'm deeply intuitive, I'm deeply empathic. And so that's been a part of, I think what drew me, I think my trauma is what drew me to this field. And mm. it was a little bit more removed than the trauma I endured. It was safe to kind of work in this capacity with these children. It was safe for my healing process. But I was screaming the same thing, like, hey, this isn't just like, are we looking at these factors? And are we addressing this with the caregivers? Are we addressing this with the police department? Another part of what I do is I create systems and help train for safe de-escalation mm. because these little black boys and girls grow up to be grown black men and women. Mm. And then they become a threat, a perceived threat in society. And cops don't know how to effectively interact with, mm. you know, these clients, right. Who are nonverbal, who are 300 pounds, right. Who are engaging in these behaviors because there's a need that's not being met and then they're losing their lives. Right. And so a part of what I do is help bridge the gap in understanding and create safety escalation 
for these people. So yes, absolutely. I'm hearing people talk about these things. I think the conversation is late, but I will take what I can get. <laughs> hope that we can continue to have these conversations. It's crucial that we are not, I think, um, trying to tackle the situation like we have previously and that we really are looking at a more holistic approach to providing services, not just mental health services and not just behavioral health services, but integrating the entire kind of microsystem and macro systems. Mm, amazing. Um, now, I know you said, so you, you have one older child, which would be mm -hmm. your brother that you adopted. No. When younger so child. that's Alexia. So right. I have my older brother who's 38 now. And then I have my older daughter who's 24. Mm. And then I have a six-year-old. Oh my gosh. Okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So what um what are you seeing in your older children and how they've developed based on everything that you went through with them and then everything that you learned in school and, and being an example for them? Mm -hmm. That's a really, that's an interesting question. I've never been asked yeah. that, though I do do a lot of reflection. So my older daughter was with me through, like, I always say, like, she's my ace. Like she <laughs> um, has been with me through hell. Um, and her life started off potentially, right, similar to how my life started off. But I was intentional about what I was exposing her to. And so I was in therapy, mm -hmm. um, but I struggled. I struggled with anxiety and depression, which then I didn't know about. But looking back, I can mm -hmm. see the classic signs. Um, and she was like me, though. She was like me as an adult. So she just had a capacity about her that was just like, get stuff done. She, that's what she saw. Uh -huh. um, and so now she struggles to find her way as a young adult and she's, she's figuring it out and I'm learning how to be a mother to a grown up, which is really <laughs> hard to do. Um, and then I'm a very different mother to my baby who is a lot like me as a little girl. So mm -hmm. she's sensitive and she's empathic and she's kind of like this little fragile bird. Um, but my own trauma interferes with the way I mother her. And so I'm in deep, still deep intensive therapy to work on um, identifying triggers that come up that because I don't want to re-traumatize mm. my baby. Right. And I have to, I have a different level of awareness because she has a different level of needs. Um, and I don't know, this makes me emotional, forgive me, mm. but I don't always know how to mother her because I was never mothered in that way. Right. With my older daughter, I knew what to do because she was so much like me, but with my baby, when I'm seeing like the sensitivity and the vulnerability, I only know how to react how I was treated. Mm -hmm. Right. So I'm literally as a clinical psychologist, <laughs> as a behavior analyst, having to use my clinical skills to really talk through my very emotional responses towards my baby. And that's a challenge. But I, again, I'm committed to not traumatizing her. So it forces me to show up differently for her. And I think that's the realization that I have that I will always be on my healing journey and that it's always going to challenge me to show up the way that I need to for anyone um, sitting across from me. And the most important people that sits across from me are my husband and my two daughters. And so Yes, it's very different, very intentional. And the work doesn't end because you reach a certain level of success or insight or growth. It's always continual. Mm -hmm, definitely. Wow. So what continues to inspire and motivate you to ha have your own agency? And, and then what's next for you? Um, really my girls, right. Continuing to do the work on me so that I am, that my legacy isn't just my trauma, mm -hmm. right. Because that's a big part of my journey and it's a big part of what I talk about, but it's not the most important part. Really. It's my, it's my healing and it's my continual healing. Um, and so I will continue to show up. I think for so long in my life, I've been I, I've, I've considered myself a bird with a broken wing mm. and I've been quietly working in the trenches, right. With my clients and my communities. 
And now I think with the publication of Phenomenal Woman and the response that I get from people who hear my story and see how I've been able to work through my healing journey, I'm motivated to keep talking, even though it's terrifying, even though I still cry, even though um, I still am overly emotional when I think about certain parts of my life. It's important that another woman hears this and knows that they too can overcome and that they too are allowed to feel all the things that they feel. That's what motivates me to keep going. And I just want to continue this advocacy work. I want to continue to um, show up for people who are underrepresented um, because I realize that I have developed a certain level of privilege and I want to use that privilege to support people who don't have it. And I want to bridge the gap so that they're not, again, treated and re-traumatized in ways that are unnecessary. So that's what I will continue to do, I hope, until the day that I die. Well, that's so beautiful. It's so beautiful. Thank you. I really appreciate you sharing your story with us today. Thank there- you for having me. Of course, of course. Is there anything else that you'd like to share with our audience before we sign off? I think just, um, I always say um, as much as I can, and I think this is the motto of my life, um, get somewhere and get quiet. Like, or in other words, like go sit down somewhere, right? Like get quiet and get to know yourself so that you can determine the next steps for your life. I'm thankful that that was a skill that I learned early on in my life. Um, and it's really helped navigate me to living a life of intention and joy, um, something that I've always desperately, I think, wanted. And so my encouragement would be for you to get somewhere and get quiet, get to know yourself so that you can make meaningful decisions about the next steps in your life. Thank you. And how, what's the best way for people to find you if they wanted to follow you on social media, learn more about your company and your services that you offer? Thank you. So you can actually find me um, at Danielle Beal, D-A-N-Y-E-L-L-E, B as in boy, E-A-L, at gmail.com. Um, I... You can find me there. And then my organization is Loving Hands Family Support Services. You can look up the same um, and you'll find me and you can reach out. I answer every email. I answer every text. I respond to every piece of correspondence. I do not take for granted that you've taken out time in your day to reach out to me. And so I want to honor that request by responding. So reach out. I'd love to hear from you and I'd love to see how I can help and support you. And I just have a couple of last questions. One is, what was the most surprising thing when you decided to go out on your own, start your own business? What was the most surprising thing that you discovered about yourself or about starting a business? (laughs) Um, Really the limitations that I have. Mm. So I knew that I was offering a good service and a good product because it was led by my values and my values guide me. Um, I've done a lot of work to kind of find these values. What was most surprising was that I, I wasn't a natural entrepreneur. I'm not a natural business owner. And I was surprised to find those limitations and then trying to figure out ways to get through those limitations in a way that didn't discourage me from the passion and the drive that I have to provide these services. It was melding that, those, that information together and finding a way through that. So that was the most, I I think, surprising thing, if that makes sense. Oh yeah. I think that's one of the hardest things about entrepreneurship is we all get excited about the work that we love doing, but then we're like, oh, but I also have to do all this other way. I don't know how to do that. How do I like get over this hurdle? Yes. Yeah. Now, um, my very last question is, do you have a favorite quote or a mantra that you like to live by or that you'd like to share? I do. Let me see if I can. I want to make sure that I can, um, that I can shoot. So let me see. It's Helen Keller and it's, um, I was going to try to look it up, but it's going to take too long. It's, um, Alone, we can do so little. Together, we can do so much. 
And I just, I always think she's a big inspiration to me. And I always think about how she was locked inside of her own world. And then, you know, Ann Sullivan came behind her and, and kind of just supported her and kind of showed her a whole new world and all the things that she accomplished. And I just, I think that that's right, that alone we can do so little, but together we can do so much. And so that's kind of a quote that I live by daily. And that just gave me chills. <laughs> yes. Dr. Beal, thank you again for coming on your brand Amplified and sharing your journey, your story to become who you are today and how you're spreading goodness into the world with your talents, your passion, your authenticity, and helping change that cycle of generational trauma that exists in so many communities. Really Thank appreciate you. it. And Thank you so much for having me, Annika. It's been a pleasure. Absolutely. And to our listeners, we'll have lots of details about Dr. Danielle Beal in our show notes. And this is one of the episodes featuring the Shenomenal Women. Come back for another episode on Shenomenal Women tomorrow as one of our special December episodes. And I will be back again soon. And thank you for listening. Want more? Check out AmplifyWithAnnika.com or follow me on socials at Amplify with Annika. Editing long podcasts like this or webinars for social is time consuming. Simplified AI Clips uses AI to turn your lengthy videos into short, viral clips. Create shareable content from your recordings in a few minutes. Built for small businesses and marketers looking to save time and boost engagement, visit simplified.com and use Annika 30 to save 30% today.